Hello, everybody. We're going to get ready to start. It's a blessed time to be in the house of the Lord today, right? Amen. Is that right? Amen. 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 At this time, we're about to enter into the presence of the Lord, so I would like to ask for everybody to rise so we can come correct. <laughs> Amen. 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 I'm glad to be back. I'd like to open up in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you as humbly you know, Father God. We've been interceding all week, all morning, Father God, just for this moment, Father God. We, we pray that, Father God, you just bless us with your presence, Father God. We just want to touch you today, Father. We just want to feel your breath, Father God. We just want to feel you, Father God. We thank you for everything you've done for us. We thank you for allowing us to be here at this moment, this morning, for us to receive today, Father God, to give today, Father God. We thank you, Father God. We pray that you just remove any worries and any cares in our lives right now, Father God, and allow us to focus immediately on you all day, Father God, all night, Father God. Thank you, Jesus, for all you've done, Father God. I pray these things in the name of Jesus, I pray, Father God. Amen. Amen.
Yeah, so next I just have the privilege of introducing somebody who I get to have the opportunity also to speak to every day. Just he's a he's a true man of God. If I can say just one thing about him, he's rooted. He's just rooted, and he knows who God is. And um, if you could, if you all could just um, just welcome Alex Orlowski, brother Alex Orlowski. Praise God. So good to be back here today. Um, me and Phil uh, haven't been me here for, what, two months? He's been a little bit longer than me even, but just so good to be back here um, with my family and uh, with like-minded people. Um, the last few, to be 100% honest with you, the last few months have been a struggle for me. I've been going through a lot of transition in my life, um, and leading up to this, leading up to today even, I had an idea of what I was going to speak about. Um, it's going to be more so of a testimony to try to help you guys to learn from some of the mistakes that I've made. Um, and as I was in this prayer meeting this morning, um, I recommend anyone who's looking for a kickstart to their prayer life or anyone that's looking to just connect with God, 8.30 on Sunday mornings come out. Um, it was such a blessing to be out here. So as I was praying, I was just, you know, giving it to God. Last night as I went to sleep, I, I felt this... Um, this tugging from God that I wasn't going to speak about what I thought I was going to. And I was, I, I began to, once again, began to worry about it and think about, Lord, well, what do you want me to speak about? What do you want me to speak about? And I decided I'm just going to go to bed. I'm just going to trust you. I'm just going to put it in your hands tomorrow when we come to prayer, when we when we worship. I believe that you're going to move on my heart to, to tell me what to speak about. And I'm back there in the middle of the auditorium praying, and I'm, I'm trying to say Jesus, and the name Joshua keeps coming out of my mouth. And then I started trying to say Jeshua in the Old Testament. Jesus' name was referred to as Jeshua, um, and, but I kept saying Joshua. And I began to think about Joshua, and I began to realize everything that's been going on in my life. The message that I wanted to tell today in more of a testimonial can be brought forth in the Word of God. Not my Word, but the Word of God. Now, when you think about Joshua, the number one thing about Joshua was he wasn't afraid. The, the Israelites were in bondage in, in Egypt for 400 years, and, and the Lord took them out of that bondage, and they were roaming around in the wilderness. This journey that was supposed to be a 12-day journey, the Israelites were roaming around the same mountain over and over and over again for 40 years. The problems in their life, the struggles in their life, the struggles that I've had in my life the past couple months, I've been looking at that mountain every single day. God's delivered me on a daily basis. He's showed me his love. He's filled me up with his compassion, his mercy. And yet I've continued to go back. I've continued to look up at that mountain and think to myself, how can I possibly get through this? How can I possibly get through this struggle? The Israelites were the same way. They were in the wilderness. They were already delivered from their bondage. God wanted to take them to the promised land. He promised them that they would have the land flowing with milk and honey, flowing with blessing. And yet they were too scared to take it. They were living in fear. God told them, go take the promised land. And what did they do? They began to question it. They began to think, how can they possibly do this? They sent 12 spies to go check out the land. 12 of the men of Israel, including Joshua, Caleb, and, a few, and 10 other men. And they went to look at the land, and it was full of giants. These, these men, if you've heard the story of David and Goliath, the Goliath was, was 9 foot 9 inches tall, some, some commentaries say. He's about 10 feet tall. And this land was filled with giants. And the, the 12 spies went in. They said, they said, we can't go in and take the land. There's too many giants. I can't come take this peace that you've offered me, Lord, because there's too many giants. There's too many obstacles in my life right now. And I'm afraid. I'm living in fear right now. Because there's too many things in the, in the path for me to take a hold of your promise. What we need to realize is that the word of God is a book full of promises. Just like the promised land, the land of Israel was a promise that God made to Abraham and told him that his seed would take a hold of this promised land. But at the same time, it's our responsibility as Christians, as people that have a relationship with God, not to just believe him that he died on the cross, not to just believe that he is God, but to believe that every promise he has for us is true. I've continued to struggle with uh, this warfare going on in my mind the last month or so, and I continue to pick up the same problem. I continue to roam around that mountain, but Jesus is saying, no, take the land. Take the land. I have equipped you with everything you need. I have equipped you. And the, the battle is not ours is what we need to realize. The battle is not what can Alex do to get through these, these obstacles. When I begin to think about the struggles that I've had have been me beginning to look into the future, me thinking about how am I gonna, how am I gonna do all this? How am I going to manage this, my career, relationships, different issues? How am I going to do all this? 
And when I go into the future, I'm going there without a God because God, yes, he is, he was, he is, he is to come, he is everlasting. But when you begin to make your own future, when you begin to go with your own mind into that place, you're going there with no God, you're going there on your own. And that's what I've been doing. And that's what I want to, so, I'm so desperate today. I've never been more desperate to, to reach somebody in this audience that, that may be going through something, that's got a trial, a struggle, a mountain in their life right now. Something that you see, you may look at, look at as insurmountable. You can't get through this. The struggle has been defeating you over and over again for weeks, for months, for years. This sin that you may be struggling with, this doubt that you may be struggling with. The Bible tells us, fear not, only believe. And the one thing about Joshua was he wasn't afraid. He wasn't afraid. I, I've been living in fear. Some of you out there, someone's been living in fear. That we're not going to live up to God's expectations. That we're not going to live up to what he has for us. We just need to simply sit back and trust him. In the New Testament, Jesus says, if any man have faith, if any man say to this mountain, remove from hence and be thrown yonder, saying you can take, you can pick up this mountain and you can throw it if you do not doubt your mind. He wasn't talking about a physical mountain. He was saying the mountains in our life, the struggle in your life, the thing that you've been going back and back and back to over and over again, that Jesus is telling you, no, I've delivered you from this. I've given you this peace. When Jesus was resurrected from the dead, he didn't come and say, I leave you with my joy. I leave you with um, you know, my love. Of course he did. He didn't say, he didn't say I leave you with my mercy. He said over and over again, my peace, the peace that passes all understanding is only going to come through us accepting it. He's given it to us. We need to accept it. We need to stop looking at the mountains, stop looking at the giants and start looking to him. And when it comes down to it in the end, yes, Jesus, he promised the Israelites the promised land. Um, we need to take a hold. They had to take a hold of that promise. But what I want to relate it to today is taking a hold of Calvary. Taking a hold of Calvary. Not just looking at it, yes, Lord, you died for me on the cross. You died for me on the sins. But no, we have to take into account everything that was accomplished on Calvary. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I've sinned over and over again. You've sinned over and over again. Whether you're you know, willing to admit it or see it, we, we're all sinners. We all fall short. He died for that sin. He cleansed us when we take confidence in his blood. But more so than that, what I want to... What I want to uh, just express to you today that is that not only did he die for your sin, but he died for anything that you could possibly go through. The Bible says in Isaiah, surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. This mental warfare that I've been going through, that you've been going through, this doubt that you've been going through, he paid the price for that. You straying off the path and doing your own thing, as I have found myself doing the Bible says I was, he was bruised for our iniquity, our iniquity being us trying to do our own thing, trying to get away from the will of God, trying to satisfy the, the, the lust of the flesh, trying to say, Lord, I want this. Why aren't you giving me this? That's our iniquity, trying to do it on our own. He was bruised for that iniquity. He was wounded for our transgressions. And what's pertained to me most of all is he, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. Any lack of peace, I've, I've come to take for, in my life, I've taken for granted peace of mind. I've always just had such a peace in my heart. And when that's taken from you, it's something that, it's not something to mess around with. It'll, it'll destroy you. And the devil's going to use that opportunity to get into your head and begin to speak these lies in you. But we, what we need to do as Christians, as Bible-believing Christians, that don't just believe that Jesus was the Son of God, God in the flesh. We need to take a hold of every single promise, just as the Israelites had to take a hold of the promised land. Jesus gave them the promise and said, go, take the land. And it says right after that, they began to, to assign 12 men to go look. They began to count their army. They began to see what could they do. Were they, did they have enough to stack up to the odds that were placed against them? What we need to realize is the battle is not ours. The battle is the Lord's. David had such a clear understanding of this, that everything he was doing, it wasn't by his own strength. It was by God. It was by trusting in Him. The Bible says, for when we are weak, then we are strong. And I've never seen that to be more true. I've never, I've never realized how much I'm not, I'm not taking every promise in the Word of God and, and receiving it. God's given me deliverance from this peace over, from this, the chastisement of my peace. He gave it to me 2,000 years ago. And yet I continue to pick it back up. I continue to pick it up as if saying, God, what you did wasn't enough. The stripes that you took on your back, the, the anguish that you had in your soul, the nails that were in your hands, the, 
the thorns that were on your head. It wasn't enough, God. I'm going to pick it back up because I don't think it was enough. I think my problems are bigger than what you faced. How dare us? But God forbid that I should glory saving the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. God forbid that I should say, God, my problems are too big for you. God forbid that I should say, Lord, you don't know what's going on in my heart. I'm different. I'm different from all those people that have been delivered. I'm different because, Lord, it's just too big of a, of a mountain, Lord. Look what he did. Look what he did on the cross. Look what he did. He was here for 32 years. He was perfect so that we don't have to be. I continue to try to pressure myself. There's those of you in this room that continue to pressure yourself to try to be perfect, to try to think, God, I need to live up to your expectation. No, we're never going to live up to his expectation. Like I told you before, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But did he not know this from the beginning of time? Did he not know that? When he gave us the choice to choose between good and evil, between our own will and his will. He was perfect so that we don't have to be. He, he lived 32 years without sin. He struggled with everything that you're struggling with. Everything that you're struggling with, Phil. Everything, Denzel. There's nothing that he couldn't, that he hasn't redeemed us from. And it just comes, when it comes down to it, I'm as guilty as anyone in this room, if not more so, that we need to take a hold of these promises. He doesn't want the person that's going to church seven days a week. He doesn't want the person that is going to read their Bible every day. Yes, he wants those things. Those things are going to help you. But he wants the person that's going to simply lay aside their burdens, their struggles, and simply trust him. Yeah. Saying, Lord, you, what you did was enough. What you did on Calvary was more than enough for me. So what I just so desperately desire for every one of us is to fully just grasp who he is, grasp what he did, grasp what he's doing in this ministry, grasp what he's doing at 8.30 in the morning in this place on Sunday mornings. Every person that's in this place right now is not by accident. The, the Lord has confirmed to me this morning that we need to take a hold of his promises. We need to stop wandering around that mountain in the wilderness. We need to stop roaming. And we need to start getting in line. It's a 12-day walk from Egypt to the promised land. It's not a 40-year journey. This struggle is not meant to last a month, two months, two years. This struggle is meant to be, okay, show, Lord, I realize I, I need you. I realize I can't do this on my own. The Lord puts struggles in our lives to, to help us to realize we are insufficient. We are totally insufficient. To, to stack up to these odds. But he wants us to trust him. He wants to say, Lord, I'm nothing without you. Lord, I surrender. Your will be done. Your will be done, Lord. Jesus. So I just want to encourage you that whatever you're facing right now, I know that everybody in this place is facing something right now. And, you know, we just need to, I'm speaking to myself, we need to just take a hold of his promise. We need to take a hold of the peace that he's given us. We need to take a hold of the love, the love that he has for us. The love of God manifested for, in us that he, he so loved the world that he came. He wrapped himself in flesh and he died for us. We need to realize, I need to realize how much he loves us. All these struggles I'm going through, all these struggles you're going through. If we can just comprehend, not in our head, but in our heart, the love that he has for us. Everything else would take care of itself. My grief, my sorrow, my pain, that sin, that struggle. If we could just realize that he has an everlasting and infinite love for us. Just accept that love. Just embrace that love. Stop fighting the will of God. Stop looking for all the answers. Start living it. Start trusting him. That's what he wants. He just wants us to trust him like a child. When a child, when, a, when parents tell a child we're going to Disney World in four or five months, that child is so excited. They're overjoyed. That whole four or five months, all they're looking forward to is that trip to Disney World. So that whole time, everything they do is so amazing. It's such a blessing. People see the joy. Well, Disney World is, you know, this, this amusement park, but we have the ultimate, the ultimate blessing. God gave us heaven. He gave us paradise. God's, God's promised us this promised land. He's promised us eternal life with him. We should be looking towards that with hope. We should be so excited for that, that people will just see that, that peace, that love, that excitement in us, that they're going to want it. They're going to want in. They don't, we, don't, we don't need to walk around struggling, um, 
weighed down by our burdens as I so often do. But we need to take a hold of the peace and let that light really shine in us. The Bible says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. But, but we just need to let that light shine, in, not in terms of, yes, in our works, but in our, in our, in our mannerisms, in, our, um, in the way that we express ourselves, just in that peace, that happiness. People are going to see that light. You look at Richard and you have no doubt that Jesus is in his life. You have no doubt that he is at such peace, that he's so happy. And it's because he simply trusts God. Nothing else needs to, that's the base of everything. Trusting God, loving God, having a personal relationship with him is all we need. Everything else is going to extend from that. And like I said, I'm not going to stay up here too long, but just look at that mountain and realize he's higher than the mountains. He's bigger than the mountains that we face. He's bigger than those 10 foot tall giants in our life. He's so much bigger. He's so much more powerful. He's redeemed us from everything we're going through. So in Jesus' name, not by our own strength, but in Jesus' name, let's take authority in his name and cast those mountains into the sea and walk in newness of life with him. I love you guys. Jennifer, they, they were all, they're all alumni, they were here, so they're here today, and they always come with a word of God. They always come with the word of God and come to just, it's just good to see them again with us. Thank you for the word. Um, now we're going to have our lovely, we have, we have been blessed with two ex-praise dancers, and we have these lovely women who take their time and want to they express their worship, their love for God through dance. And we thank God for that. So I'm now going to call our ex praise dance team to come up and share what God has put on their hearts. So let's pray with them.
Definitely the spirit of the Lord is in here. Amen. 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 Let's give a praise. Amen. 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 Truly, the anointing of the spirit of the Lord is in here. Yeah, I got a good word from Brother Alex. The Lord really spoke through him. Amen. 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 Time, I want to introduce you a man's man. This brother is a true leader. As uh, soon as I met this young man, my initial response, I said, I can follow him. I can follow him. This man loves God and loves God's people. He has a shepherd's heart, meek, humble, love you. I mean love you. He loves each and every one of you. Um, he's under the tutelage of Pastor Robinson and Wanda K. Um, he's the beginning. I sometimes call him joke around like, what's up, Moses? How you feeling? <laughs> I said, Israel mourns for you, man. And uh, I want to introduce you a man of God, um, truly called into the brother brotherhood. Uh, I want to introduce you, Brother Philip Agua. Let's give him a I appreciate it, though. I appreciate it. Man, Alex, you're right, man. It's good to be back up here. You know, thank you for allowing me to be back up here, you guys, because this is just a blessing. This, I've been away so long. Man, I mean, just to feel the anointing again in a, in a place like this, it's been so long for me, and I'm just so grateful to God. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Man, you guys have no idea how much this means to me. I want to give honor to God, who's ahead of my life, and give honor to Pastor Juan K, who's Allowing me to be up here, you know. Thank you, thank you. Man. <laughs> Alex, man, they do this all to me all the time. They do this to me all the time. They always put me after Alex, man. <laughs> that sucks. <laughs> hey, but, you know, the Lord, the Lord uses us in different ways. And, uh, man, just pr right now, in this house, I just want to talk to, talk to you about what the Lord has placed on my heart. You know, the Lord has... First of all, I'm going to be coming out of Psalms 34, 1 through 3. I won't, I won't, I'll try not to be before you long. You know, I know how it is. And, <laughs> but I want to speak to you about what the Lord has put on my heart. It's so good to be back. You guys look beautiful. <laughs> you say amen when you get there. Amen. 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 <clears throat> Psalms 34, 1 through 3. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make it boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name. Saints, I want to come to you and talk to you about something you already know. Something that, that, has, that's, that should be ingrained in you. This is the reason why we're here, you guys. We're here to praise the Lord. We're, praise, we're here to praise and worship the Lord with everything within us. The Lord has created our bodies, our spirits, everything within us to praise. Praise is a sacrifice. It's not for us at all. We praise to please the Lord, the Lord, our Lord and Savior. You know, if anybody knows about praise, it's King David. You know, King David, you know, all through the book of Psalms, he, all through the book of Psalms, he just... He stressed and expressed uh, the importance of praise mm -hmm. all through the book. You can, just, you can just read it through all his words and everything. So I just want to ask you the question right now. How is your praise and worship? How is it? Is it okay? Is it scheduled for only Sundays? Mm -hmm. Or is it a lifestyle? Mm -hmm. Saints, praise is an expression of favorable judgment as defined. It's an expression of warm approval and admiration. It's an expression of thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. We're to praise at all times. We're to praise in times of rest, times of peace, times of trials and tribulations, and even when trials and tribulations are over. Matter of fact, some battles can't be won unless you praise and worship. You know, Alex was talking about Joshua. Something about Joshua is he was so faithful, and he looked towards the Lord for everything. Let's take the wall of Jericho. He had to get past the wall of Jericho to get to the promised land. So he consulted God. He said, God, what do I do? And God said, you know, 
It's too easy. Exalt me. Praise me. March around that wall seven times and just praise me. He did that. And the walls came down, praising and worshiping. Saints, what I'm trying to say to you is to get to the promised land, sometimes you have to praise and worship. Amen. You have to praise and worship. That's what we're, that's what we're here for. Some battles can't be won unless we praise and worship, saying. So, how do we praise? You know, I can't, I personally can't sing or dance, you know. <laughs> I remember one cast me to be on the praise team, you know. I looked around, you know, she kept asking, and I was like, all right, I'll do it. When we started to sing, you know, I would step back from the mic and, uh, and sing. Nobody would notice that, I was pretty good at it, you know. But. She knew I couldn't sing or sing or dance. She knew, but she un she wanted to ingrain in me that praise doesn't have a style. You know, it's all about the heart. We're not, that's why this is called the praise team and not a choir. We're not up here to entertain the people. We're up here to praise the Lord at all times. At all times. So, there's no excuse. The Lord says, "Let everything that has breath praise the Lord." That's me, you, everything that has breath. Praise the Lord. So you don't have to you don't have to sing and dance, you know. That's cool. That's a gift. But praise the Lord. You know, there's so many different ways to praise the Lord. The Lord has blessed us with so many different gifts, so many different talents. You know, the Lord, if you're good at technology, use that to praise the Lord. If you're good at creative writing, art, use that to praise the Lord. There's no excuse. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Amen. But let's take this a step further. You know. How do we make praise and worship become a part of our lives, our lifestyle? Well, we gotta strive to be Christ-like at all times. We gotta be loving and serving to others. We have to honor and glorify God at all times. But how do we do that? You know, we can do that at our jobs, in our classes, by having an attitude of thanksgiving. You know, showing love to others, being encouraging with our joyful words to others. Sometimes our praise can brighten up somebody's day. Your praise can save a life. You can, you can uh, praise and worship at your home, your dorms, even in your car. And when you do that, just clear that space that you have of anything that may hinder you with your relationship with Christ. Also, show your gratification to the Lord by keeping that place clean. Yeah, I said it clean. <laughs> I mean, if you, were to, if you were to get your son or daughter something, if you were to bless them with a car or a house, or anything, wouldn't you want them, wouldn't you want them to show your, their appreciation by keeping it clean, maintaining it? <laughs> we are all blessed with something. Man, y'all didn't like that, huh? <laughs> it's okay. I told God y'all weren't like that, but you told me to say it. <laughs> you gotta keep that place, you gotta, you gotta be good stewards of what you have, saints. Good stewards. If the Lord can trust you with a little, he'll bless you with a lot. Be good stewards of our stuff, bro. We can also bless the Lord in our organizations. Be that light. Be that light and do what's right. The Lord has really placed us in a position where we got to be that Jesus. People have to see Jesus within you. Let your light shine before man so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. They need to see that Jesus in you. They need to. Saints, all praise and worship leads to the Father in heaven. The Lord says, and whatever you do, do it, do it heartily unto the Lord and not unto man. Whatever you do, you do it to the Lord. Do it for the Lord. Now, you know, okay, I got it. Praise and worship in my life. I got it. But what can that do for me? First of all, you know, praise and worship isn't for us. It's for the Lord. But the Lord knows that we're selfish. So, <laughs> he, and he loves us. So he, he says, you know, if you bless, if you praise me, I can give you rest and peace in your life, no matter what you're going through. Whether it be exams, whether it be financial issues, or just mourning over a death. You know, I don't know if you noticed, but funerals at churches are called cel are celebrations now. Home-going services. It's praise and worship. It's praise and worship. You know, I used to, I used to, hear people say praise him in advance. I never understood that. It never clicked to me, it never made sense to me. Why would I praise God if my car ain't fixed yet? <laughs> Why would I praise God 
if I haven't got a job yet, if I haven't got a job yet, you know, I always say to myself, you know, I'll thank God after I get a job. I'll thank God after he gets me through this situation. I'll thank God after I pass this exam. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I never understood what praise was. Praise is an expression of faith. Faith of, and declaration of victory. It's you knowing that God has everything under control. No matter what the circumstances are. Praise and worship, bro. We show our faith by praise and worship. So I challenge you. I challenge you if you're going through anything. Yeah. Apparently Alex prophesied and everybody's going through something. <laughs> but if you're going through something, I challenge you to praise and worship the Lord. Show him that you trust him. No matter what your situation is, no matter what it is, just praise and worship wholeheartedly. Saints, in order to praise and worship, you have to have a heart of purity. You have to get rid of all your sins by repenting. We serve a God who can do that. We have to have a spirit of humility, a spirit of submission to God's will. Not our own, but God's will. A spirit of obedience and a spirit of humility. And an awareness of God's presence. It's not about us, saints. It's not about us at all. It's all about God. So we can't, how can we worship the Lord if we have sin in our lives? Mm -hmm. We have to repent. Mm -hmm. Saints, I love Psalms 150. If you ever get a chance, go ahead and read it. It's a blessing. Psalms 50 goes like this. It's mighty. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the heavens of his power. Praise him in his mighty works. Praise him according to his abundance and greatness. Praise him with a trumpet sound. Praise him with a lute and a harp. Praise him with a tambourine and dance. Praise him with string instruments and wind, wind instruments and flutes. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord, saints. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Yes. Everything. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. If you don't get anything, just know that. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Yes. Praise and worship. Saints, all praise and worship ultimately begins with a personal relationship with Christ. That encounter that we all long for. We need to get to the place where praise and worship is a part of our lifestyle. And not just scheduled for Sundays or just okay. We need to make it a part of our lifestyle. Yes. You know, when Jesus taught us to pray with the Lord's Prayer, he began and ended with praise. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Praise, that's praise. Yes. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Praise. Yes. Even this very service, we begin with praise. And we end on the altar with praise and worship. Yes. Praise and worship is a way of life. Yes. We have to get it in, ingrained in us, saints. Ingrained in us. Yes. The Lord came that we may have life. And that we may have it more abundantly. The Lord has high standards for us. It's our job to get to those standards. Amen. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord's hands. Pray my strength in the Lord. Thank you. I thank God that my son has come home. <laughs> Philip, that was a good word. Thank the Lord for that. Well, we all know it's Valentine's Day coming up soon. And for those that have that significant other, you're just in so happy and everything's just so great. But then for those that don't have that significant other that's still waiting for somebody, is there some people here waiting for somebody? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> well, here, let me tell you a secret of what to do if you really want the one God has for you. You pray. You pray and you ask Jesus to send you the one he wants you to be with. Now when you pray that way, get ready, honey. Because he's going to be the best thing ever happened to you. And she's going to be the best thing that ever happened to you. <laughs> well, about 33 years ago, I did that very thing that I just told you to do. It was, about, it was in January. It was two months before I turned 16 years old. As a 15-year-old girl, 
I would tell you back then I was closer to 16, so I was 15 and almost 16. And I got down on my knees one Sunday afternoon. And I said, Jesus, I want you, I don't want to just date boys. Because I look around and I see that dating thing ain't working too good for my friends. Because they're with this one and then this one and then this one. And they're just from one to the other and getting their hearts broken. And Lord, I don't want that. So Jesus, what I want is I want you to send me the man that you want me to spend my life with. Now let me tell you, when I prayed that prayer, there was no pretty boys in church that I went to. They was all ugly and there wasn't many of them. And I, and I said, I said, Jesus, he's got to be filled with your presence. I want him to be a man of God. That was what I prayed for, a man of God. And I said, Lord, please let it be beautiful. <laughs> I really did. And I was at my mama's knee when I prayed this prayer. My mom was cracking up laughing because she thought I was just being silly, being, doing something to make her laugh. But I was so serious. And I got up, and it dawned on me, I didn't want to wait around for that guy. So I got back down in front of my mom at her knee, and I said, Jesus, I forgot to tell you just one thing. I need him this week. <laughs> you know when they say, put your money where your mouth is? I mean, I had to trust in God. I mean, but I don't know. I can only tell you, that, and I don't know how it works for everybody, but I can tell you for me, I truly trusted him. I don't really think there was any doubt in me whatsoever that Jesus was bringing my husband to me that week. The man he wanted me to spend my life with. So I went to church that Sunday night. Didn't get to go to my church that I was normally going to. But I got to go back on Wednesday night. And on Wednesday night. Now let me back up just a second. <laughs> I don't want to leave out anything that... that you know, I, I, I have to give you all the juicy parts. Well, not really all of them today, but if you want a longer story, I can give you that later. <laughs> but on that same afternoon that I was down praying that prayer before God and trusting Him, Andrew Robinson went to church. It was a Sunday afternoon service. Backslidden on the Lord. Had laid out drunk the night before. Okay, but he he really he really wanted Jesus, but he didn't know how to stick. People hurt him. He got hurt in church. People that was supposed to love him and care for his soul really didn't. So he got messed up. And he really didn't have a good family life. But he came back to the Lord that day. I didn't even know he existed. <clears throat> he didn't know I existed. And we lived about ten minutes apart. He was four years older than me. And he came to church that Sunday afternoon that I prayed. And he went to that altar and he gave his heart back to Jesus. And the Lord filled him with the Holy Ghost that very day. He had to get it all because Jesus was getting him ready for me. <laughs> and so that Wednesday night I went to church. And oh my goodness. The ugly boys were still there. But oh, that beautiful one had walked in the door. Now, he just barely shook my hand during our little meet and greet time. We had a little meet and greet at church. And he just went by and shook my hand, didn't even introduce himself because he was so backward and, and hillbilly, and I was too. And, and, and I had to keep it to myself. But down deep inside, I was like, oh, thank you, Jesus. Mm, thank you, Jesus. Lord, you're doing good, don't you? church that night and mommy was awaiting. She said, well, honey, did the Lord send your husband this week? Now, my mom loved the Lord, but she thought I was really being silly. And I said, well, mom, I think he might have. I'm not really 100% sure, but I think he might have. She says, well, did, 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 remember you said this week? I said, well, mama, the week ain't over. 
Well, see, Andrew kind of noticed me, and so he went to his sister, who was also attending my church, and he says, I need you to get her phone number. <laughs> and so my mom, I, we just let it go. Well, on Thursday evening, now remember, I ain't never went out with a boy in my life. I ain't never dated nobody. I ain't never been kissed by no boy. I, ain't, I just been in church loving Jesus. And then on Thursday evening, Andrew Robinson called me on the phone. And I answered the phone. He told me who he was. And he told me, he says, you know, he says, I work for coal mines. And we have just hit a bonus in coal. And so the guy that owns the mines is taking everybody and their wife or the ones of us who are single. We can bring a friend. Taking us out to a steak dinner tomorrow night. And I wanted to see if you would go with me. So I took the phone away and I said, Mom, Andrew Robinson's on the phone and he wants to know if I can go out to a steak dinner with him tomorrow night, but you won't let me, will you? She said, yeah, I think I will let you. Oh, okay. So then I says, what time will you have me home? Because I knew my mom was not going to let me stay out late. Most of, most of our dates, I had to be home by 9 o'clock. Okay? And so I was the baby of seven kids. She wasn't giving up on me easy. You know, he couldn't have me that easy. And so he, he says, well, I, because it's an hour's drive and it starts at 7, it's probably going to be 11 o'clock when I have you home. And I says, Mom... He says it's going to be 11 o'clock when he can have me back home. So you won't let me go, will you? She said, well, I think that would be okay. Because you're going to a steak dinner. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> and so on Friday evening, that same week, he came in and picked me up and took me on our first date. <laughs> and he... <laughs> And at the end of the day, I was a nervous wreck. So he brings me back home and walks me up to the front porch, to the front door, and I reach out and I says, thank you so much for a wonderful evening. <laughs> well, now remember, I've not been out on a date. But Mr. Handsome <laughs> has been on many dates. And he don't end a date without a kiss. And I was like, oh, God. <laughs> so here... Him. And it still wasn't. He was not going to stop there. Well, then he kissed me. <laughs> Inside, I was doing flip-flops and cartwheels and jump jacks and saying, Jesus, you hit this nail on the head. You did a great thing, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I love you. I mean, I was praising him with everything in me, honey. Well, I walked through the door. Now, the house lights was all turned off, and I thought, well, this is kind of strange that my mom would turn these lights off because I know she has to be up. And I walked through the front door. By that time, he'd done got his car and left. I walked through the front door, and my mom says, I hate that boy. She said, I wish to God he would drop dead right here and now. And I turned on the light, and there my little mom said, tears streaming down her face and she said he's the one she knew well see I was just so young and so naive and so I didn't know what, everything I needed to pray for but Jesus is God and he knew just what I needed and he sent me not just a wonderful husband but a husband that he talks about in Ephesians when he said Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. He sent me a husband. We've been almost married 30 years. This coming May 10th on graduation day when our beautiful daughter, Andrew Kay, graduates from college, we will be celebrating our 30th wedding anniversary. <laughs> And he sent me the best husband in the world. He sent me not only what I prayed for. I prayed for a man of God. And truly he has been that and he is that. We've been going and running for Jesus a long time, ain't we, baby? And like that song says, I ain't got tired yet. 
<laughs> I've been a running for Jesus a long time. And I'm so thankful that my husband truly loves me the way that God wants a husband to love a wife. And I feel so honored and so privileged that I get to share this journey with him. So I bring to you all my husband. Okay. Expect that this morning, okay. and uh, I tell you, I I feel so undeserving of the wife that God has blessed me with, you know, friend, lover, and uh, you know it's it's been a great journey as she mentioned, and the things we've done and places we've gone. One thing we've realized is we always have each other, no matter what comes our way, and it's, it's amazing when you've got someone that will share your walk with God, that spiritual connection that, you know, that you, that gets you, you know, that, when you both love God, there is such a bond that God gives you, and I understand now when, when the Lord said, they twain shall be one flesh, when he's talking about marriage, you know, and a husband and a wife, they twain shall be one flesh. And I always thought, well, united physically or whatever, but then I began to understand, you know, as I live with, you know, this wonderful life that we've shared together for years, and I realized so much more of the bond is a spiritual bond. Because you're able, to, you, you, you feel each other's needs, you, you sense you know, um, you know the direction that God wants to take you, and you get confirmation from one another because you're both men and women of prayer, and you have a relationship with God and the Word of God, and and you seek. And when you have an argument, believe it or not, we had an argument, and it was a, within a month after marriage, I threw all of her clothes out on the porch to go home to mom, and it was. <laughs> Because she kept threatening that she was going to leave when, when things weren't going her way. And so, so I told her, I said, you know, I said, just go home to mom. I was tired of hearing that. And then, then she said, she, she told me, she said, I'm not going anywhere. She said, you're not going to be happy without me. She said, if I, even if we have, I have to make your life miserable, I'm staying right here. <laughs> And, and, and so, uh, but then after a while, you know, we, we, uh, she apologized and I apologized and, and I had to go pick up all the clothes and put them back where they were supposed to be. But, but, you know, but the thing is in those arguments that we had that what helped us to resolve them was eventually we would always get to the place where we ask what does God want what does God want in this situation and and so what will please God and then whenever we both got our mindset in that way then we it was no we knew exactly what God wanted that it was so clear to us but we had to get our pride out of the way but the thing is an argument we I never had to give in to her and she never had to give in to me we just gave in to God and so there wasn't her against me or me against her, but we have both surrendered to God. And that's the wonderful thing about when God gives you someone to share this wonderful Christian life with. It is no better life. It doesn't get any greater than that. And I love the relationships that we see forming around here and just these, you know, these strong relationships. And I know we got a couple getting married here in July, and I'm so honored to be able to perform that ceremony in, in July for uh, uh, Kiana and Don. And God has really knit their hearts together. And we got others that's getting, boy, I tell you, I see God doing some things in this, in this place. <laughs> And as I've told you so many times, the best place to find someone that will serve God with you and love God with you is in church. In church. Don't go to the bar to try to find your significant other. You know, go to church. Go to the house of God. 
find somebody that loves God. And, and, and so that, I know this is quite different than any service we've ever had, you know. And uh, Wanda Kay kind of steered it this way. Actually, I was going to talk about uh, when all hell breaks loose. And, <laughs> And so it, it, did, it did kind of fit this mushy Valentine's theme that God has led us into right now. <laughs> but all hell can break through, through in marriage at times, and break loose in marriages too at times. <laughs> but God has, God has someone for you. But the thing is, what happens to a lot of young people, even young people in the church, is they start hanging with people that don't love God. They start hanging with, they start spending their time with people more outside of the church than they do with people inside the church. And, and what happens is they don't give God the chance to allow them to meet that right person. Because they're so busy over here somewhere, away from where people don't even, aren't even considering God. Not really connected to God. And, and, and so all their time is taken up. And they miss that opportunity. And I've seen so many young people, you know, and a lot of times, you know, Wanda Kay and I get a sense of God knitting some hearts together, trying to draw a, a couple of people together and, and things. And, and, and I oh my God, I wish they... You know, because we know, we just kind of know they fit. You know, we don't try to match that, but we, we sense, we sense that that, boy, that, that, that connection there, that's, that's the one. And we know, as a pastor, you can't, I don't tell somebody, this is the one for you. But a lot of times God reveals it to me in advance that I know that that's the person. In one case, well, he said, I think this is, you know, this is the right these two people need to be together. I said, yeah, I already felt that. You know, things, and let's just pray. I said, let's just pray, and we'll pray about it. And, and then, and then, the, and then the, the Lord, sometimes the Lord will bring their hearts together, but a lot of times what happens is I see this person, one of them gets so caught up with somebody that really is not spiritually connected. And it takes up the time, takes up the energy, and, be, and begins to have the control of that person's heart, that child of God's heart. And it's sad. And then what happens, God brings someone else that loves God, someone else devoted to God, to this other person that was missed. And, and it's, okay, yeah, God, you know, people don't walk in the divine will of God. Then you know, bring it, you know, bring it to someone else because there's a pool of of people that love God in the family of God that we can, you know, select from. And that's why he says, don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. You know, someone that doesn't want God, someone that doesn't love God, because that will be such a ball and chain to your walk with the Lord. And usually, what happens after marriage? What happens is these turkeys that they get hooked up with. <laughs> They'll come to church until they get married. You know, maybe a month or two. They'll, you know, they act like, man, I'm going to go to church with my wife and things. And, and they haven't tested to see if they truly love God. They haven't spent time with this person in prayer. They haven't watched how that person responds to the presence of God in a, in a church service. Do they draw to the anointing? Or do they hide back in the shadows? You know. What, what do you see, the response to that presence of God? Do they have the intimacy with God? And you see their heart just melt under the presence of the Lord. That's what you look for. And, and then what happens is that the turkey, you know, when they get married, then the, the turkey takes control of the, of the relationship and stops going to church and the wife or whichever one is the Christian, will go for a little while, but then after a while they both just quit going. Because, you know, it's, it's hard to go to church when your spouse doesn't want to go to church with you. Very difficult thing to do, to go along like that in that situation. And it's embarrassing for someone who has a spouse and that's, that husband or wife won't go with him or her. And 
But the thing is, God has destined you to soar. He has a wonderful plan for your life. He wants, he has great things in store for you because those that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And if you're going to soar, if you're going to soar like an eagle, you cannot hang with turkeys. Right? Yeah. It's okay. And we're trying to rescue turkeys, turn them into eagles. But don't marry a turkey. All right? Don't date a turkey. Don't court a turkey. Yeah. Witness to a turkey. And let God trans watch and let God transform him into an eagle. Someone that will soar with God with you first. You know, had I been in the condition I was in, Wanda K would have never give me a second thought. Uh, and I thought, God, I can't believe, I don't even know how to handle myself around a good girl. When I met her, I don't know, you know, I've never dated a good girl before. Like her. I was scared. And, and so, you know, but we learned together. We learned together. It's been a wonderful life. I can't imagine, I can't imagine it being any different. And I want that for every single one of you. And I believe God has that for every single one of you. Will you believe God for that? Will you wait on God? They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And how do we wait upon the Lord? Sometimes people say, think waiting is, is just sitting back doing nothing. But every waiter or waitress I've ever met is pretty busy. They're carrying stuff, serving stuff. And so that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to be busy in His service. He wants us to be giving ourselves to Him and occupied in His presence and loving Him and worship Him and devoted to Him. Uh, you know, doing His will in our life. And as we're busy loving the Lord and putting Him first in our life and making the right decisions at the right time. God will send that other person to help share that path, that journey with you at the right time. Praise God. Praise God. And, and many of you will be graduating soon. All right. This May. Some of you, we've got some of our alumni here that's already graduated. All right. And we're looking around. Not. <laughs> and we have we have freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors, graduate students all here today. And I know that that's one of the major things in your mind is who you know who who does God have for me? You know, will I find the right person? And so this morning, I, I, just, I just feel the way the Lord is leading things this morning is that we, in, in the way the messages have gone from Philip and Alex this morning, is because sometimes we try to strain so hard, don't we, in trying to force God's will. You know, and, and sometimes when you try to force a situation, you know, sometimes people say, oh, God, I know that's the one for me. i got to have that one. That's him or that's her. Right? And you cry and you pray. Give me that one. I want that one. And, and you don't know. It may just look like an eagle on the outside. It may be just a turkey on the inside. Right? God's protecting you. But let God, let it happen at the right time. Don't force it. Let it happen. And so this morning what we want to do, and there's some of you that are already married here, just wonderful young couples here this morning. One, another wonderful uh, you know, uh, example of godly couple this morning that served God for a long time is Dennis and Nancy back there in the back. Ask them. <laughs> some of you young married people here this morning. Be sure, bend their ear. 
You know, and, and how do they do it? They've been married longer than we have. You know, ask him, how did you survive? How did you make it when one in every two marriages end in divorce? You know, there's one thing that, that couples can do, those of you who are married, there's one thing that a, a research has shown that if couples do this one thing every day, 90, only three out of a thousand ever divorce. And there's more than 50% divorce now. And that one thing that they do that three, only three in a thousand ever divorce is they pray together every day. They pray, those couples that pray together every day, almost never divorced. And so you marry folk this morning, you, you say, well, you know, and sometimes people get married, they think, well, maybe I married the wrong one. I need to be looking for somebody else. No, when you're married, whether it's the right one or or not to start with, it's the right one now. Yeah, God has, that's the one God has for you now. Okay, and so, and, and it may, you may have started, maybe it wasn't brought together at, on the will of God as far as both of you seeking the will of God. But now you're here, now, and God can take that, and he gives you beauty for your ashes, the oil of joy for your mourning, and he restores the wasted tears, and he can make your relationship a beautiful relationship and where you will he can place you in his divine will as well so don't feel like well, I missed my person I got stuck with this duck or something <laughs> all right because you know no God 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 is so amazing that he can do anything anything he can take a Nothing and make an entire universe. Didn't he do that? Yes. Well, if he can do that, he can take the bad situation you may have found yourself in and your relationship, and he can turn it around and make it something beautiful. Yes. But you that are unmarried today, don't put yourself through the heartache and have to go through the extra trouble. You know, with bad, you know, choosing badly. But God has that special someone for you. And so what we're going to do this morning, we're going to pray. And those of you that are, are married, and those of you like Dennis and Nancy, these older folk here this morning, who've been loving the Lord for a long time, you just let the Lord lead you and help you pray for these young people this morning. Because this is something very you know, paramount on their minds, I know. And we, it's on our minds. We pray for you. One, can I pray regarding this for you every day? Because we know how important that is in your relationship. It grieves our heart when we see someone being pulled and controlled by someone who is really not connected to the anointing. And, and so I want you to stand if you're able this morning with us. And we're, remember Wanda Kay talked about she just trusted God. She prayed that simple prayer and she trusted God. And that's what we're gonna do. We're going to pray that simple prayer today. When we come to this altar, we're, by coming forward, what you're going to do is saying, God, I'm going to, the person you have for me, I'm going to leave it at your feet. And I'm just going to trust you at the right time to bring the right person into my life that I can serve you with, God. Someone that loves you. Someone full of the Holy Ghost. Someone, and, and if you're going to find the right person, what do you got to do? You got to pray, and what else? You have to be the right person. Make sure you're not a turkey, right? If you don't, if you don't get stuck with a turkey, for God's sake, don't be a turkey, right? Be an eagle. Be a man or woman of prayer. Be a man or woman of the Word of God. Be a man or woman full of the Holy Ghost. You know that has that passion for God, and so. And we're going to come forward this morning. And by coming forward, we're going to just trust God to just bring that right person in your life. If you haven't met that person yet, many of you this morning have already met that right person. And we're just going to, and, and I want you to come this morning and help pray for those that are seeking. And I want you to pray that God will help your bond be even greater. I don't even imagine, someone who doesn't know God, I can't imagine, like a, a married couple that doesn't know God, it, it, it's the intimacy that would be impossible to the level that God brings you to. I mean, the, 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 intimacy, the level of intimacy, intimacy is so much deeper 
when you are spiritually connected. It's amazing. It is amazing. Because I can't imagine it all this. It would be so surface almost. And it's such a limited love that you can share when you when it's pe two people that don't know God. It's impossible because you don't even have that agape love that comes from, that's directly from God. And that's what makes the bond so much deeper. And so this morning we're going to come, or by coming forward, we're going to just trust God and just surrender to that. Some of you have been worrying. Some of you have been, you know, just trying to, fearful of it and wonder if, does anybody want me or anybody like me or anything? God has that person for you. And, and ask God to give you wisdom to choose wisely. Ask God to give you wisdom to know when to say no to turkeys that would come. And say, hey, baby, you want to go out? Okay? To say no. Don't waste your time. With that. Time is the passing of life. Time is the passing of life. And we don't want to waste our lives, do we? It's too precious what God has given us. Time is our most is our most valuable commodity. So let's come together this morning. We're just going to trust God and surrender to Him. Say, Lord, not my will, but Lord, your will be done.